Thanks for taking the time to watch or listen into this sermon. Our prayer is always that God would use it to draw you closer to himself and deepen your love for Jesus Christ. It's also our hope that this sermon would not be used to replace God's plan for authentic relationships in your life through a local church. If you aren't already a member of a local church, we just want to encourage you to step out in faith and join a church somewhere near you. Thanks again for checking out this sermon. We pray it is a blessing to you. So, that was a lot to say. Uh, your story matters. And um, this new series that we're starting in today is called Your Story, His Glory. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the opportunity to be here. God, I thank you that we get to worship you. What a privilege. God, I pray that we understand that it's a privilege and that we uh, participate in that opportunity. God, I thank you that we get to even pray, that you made a way for us to have a relationship with you through Christ. I thank you that right now you promise that your presence is inside of all, all of your believers and you're with us as believers as we gather. God, I thank you for your word. As we open your word, I pray that you would speak to every single one of us individually and all of us corporately, Lord God. Help me to make much of you and get out of the way of what your plan is here today. In Jesus' name, amen. Your story, his glory. All believers have a story. A story of God coming into our lives and revealing himself to us so that we would put our faith in him. A story that is a powerful testimony of God's love and grace. A story that points to God and his ama amazing work to save us. All of us have a story. Everybody. And it's interesting when we talk about testimonies. They're powerful. They're beautiful. They're amazing. Um, I, I've seen testimonies maybe done wrong. Uh, I've experienced sitting inside of a service or in a, a place where a testimony went something like, man, it was crazy. I was out in the world and it was nuts. And then God showed up. And this has just been great. <laughs> like, you missed it. You missed it. You just showed that the world is exciting. And, and then God showed up. Like, you missed it. Uh, that, that's not the point. And I've also seen testimonies that, that point back to our glory instead of his glory. That go like, man, it was hard. But you know what? I figured it out. And I found God. And I worked hard. And now I'm here. Missed it. Your story, his glory. That God is doing a work in our lives, in all of our lives, and, and all of our stories will look different. And one of the worst things we can do is compare our story to somebody else's. It's one of the worst things we can do. Let's be inspired by each other's stories, but sometimes what happens is we discount a testimony based on our judgment on it. And so we look at somebody else's testimony that seems like, you know, you've heard the, the story. In fact, you're going to read some of the stories of like how, how God, people way out in the world sometimes, or maybe just in a broken state close to God, um, but maybe some of these stories will be like, wow, like there was a lot of going on and God stepped into a really broken place. Um, and sometimes you'll hear the stories of like, I don't know, you've maybe heard the testimonies, right? Like, oh man, I used to gangbang and I was a pimp and sold drugs and like it goes like this big long story and then it's like Jesus saved me and now I walk on water like this big huge transformation and we judge that testimony as like oh man I don't really have a testimony <laughs> like that's a testimony <laughs> do not do that also what can happen sometimes is we can think our testimony is greater than somebody else's do not do that what we're doing then is we're, we're, we're downplaying a redemptive work of God, which is a massive story. And if you've put your faith in Jesus, you have one. Whether he saved you from far or from near. Whether he saved you from reckless out in the world or self-righteous up in the church. If you have a, a regenerated heart, a changed life because of God, you have a story. And it doesn't need to look like everybody else's. And don't judge it based off anybody else's. I was a, um, many moons ago, I was a young life leader when I was like 20, 21. Um, and and I, w I got to go to this amazing young life camp. It was in at, uh, this camp called Malibu, uh, which sounds sunny 
and like a beach in California. Um, it's not. It's in Canada. <laughs> I'll tell you, tell you, sign up. I'm just kidding. Uh, it is in Canada, but they, they did tell you that up front. So it's amazing. One of those phenomenal facilities I've ever been to in my life. Uh, one of the cabin time experiences, and I got to share some things with these young men, and, uh, and there was some brokenness, and God used part of my story. Uh, uh, it was part of the story of me running from him um, and then drawing me back to him. And, and afterwards, the other leader we, that I shared a cabin with, uh, I hadn't known him really until we got there, and he pulled me outside, and he was like, man, I don't have a testimony. <laughs> and I was like, whoa, 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 slow down. Tell me why. Well, I grew up in church, uh, been saved like my, pretty much my whole life. Like my, my, my parents did a good job of like shielding me from the world. Um, by the grace of God, I, I, I've, I, I haven't really strayed. I haven't even felt tempted really to like run off into the, the craziness of the world. I, I love Jesus, but I don't really have a story. And I said, stop, stop. There are young people whose parents have them in church that need to hear that story. You're smarter than me. <laughs> okay, let's be honest, that's not hard. But, <laughs> but you didn't have to try to go try some of the things to realize that God is the answer in all of this. You didn't have, it was just revealed to you inside of this beautiful path without you having to go these other directions. Praise God that you have to walk into some brokenness first for you to realize that you're already well. And, and young people need to hear that story because a lot of them, parents need, parents need you to tell their kids that they don't got to try everything out in the world first. That you can be fulfilled in Christ without first knowing that nothing else fulfills like Christ. And, and so we had to have this dialogue because you have a story and if you don't have a story, you have a story. All of us do. Ephesians 2. I'll start in verse 1. And I'm going to show you some of this. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. You, me. In which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Oftentimes we think of that person as like the very worldly person. But let me just tell you something. If you're self-righteous, you're also doing that for your own desires and wickedness. Following desires and thoughts, like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Listen, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith and this not from yourself it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. No one can boast. No one can boast. It is the gift of God. Your story, the redemptive work in your life, is a place where you can't judge it against anybody else because you didn't do anything, and neither did they. The saving work that happened in you is God showing up on the scene, revealing himself to you, giving you eyes to even understand that, to put faith into him and, and to be saved. It's all to his glory and not our own. Your story, you have one, and it's significant, and it needs to be told, and, and I believe it'll impact people's lives, but it's all to his glory and not our own. If it was because of our own works, if we really could judge it off somebody else, then what we're doing is we're puffing up, and we think that the person is what the story's all about. It's not. God is. It's for his glory. Your story, his glory. We're going to look at it today in a, a sometimes fairly well-known story in Scripture. Um, if you don't know it fairly well, you will today because we're going to go through it. It's in John chapter 4. It's, it's a story of, a, of the woman at the well, if you've heard that before. Um, there's sometimes maybe uh, pros and cons to using a very familiar Bible story. Um, if it's not a familiar bi Bible story, everybody's kind of intrigued because they're like, I've never really understood this or heard this. Like, let's hear it. Um, if you've, so if you've never heard it before, uh, this is going to be awesome for you. 
I need you to understand if you've heard it before, this is still going to be awesome for you. Because one of the cons of using a familiar story is that I just said John 4, and some of you came up in church like, I know that one. And then I said, maybe you didn't know that when I said John 4, but then I said the woman at the well, and you're like, got it. <laughs> Stop it. Every time we read the Bible, God speaks to us. So, so do not kind of turn off because we think we know the story. Ask God today in this story, what is your plan to do in me, maybe through me, and, and stay open and, and present to what he's doing um, right now. So go to John 4. If you're taking notes, right, the power of a story, Jesus, Jesus changes things, really everything. Now, Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Although, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. Uh, interesting side note real quick. How many people must have been, been getting baptized um, if you're baptizing more people than the guy whose name is John the Baptizer? Like, that's what you're known for. You're, you're John the baptizer, um, and, and you're just known because people come out to you to be baptized and baptized and baptized, and now the word is spreading like Jesus is baptizing more people. When realistically he says Jesus wasn't the one baptizing, but there was so many being baptized, it was by the disciples. So he left there, Judea, and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria. Samaria. Hundreds of years before this, uh, the nation of Israel was one nation. After uh, it went King David, King Solomon, and then when it went to the past Solomon to the next generation, the kingdom split. There's a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. The southern kingdom's capital was Jerusalem, just like it was for all of Israel before that. The northern kingdom, uh, they made their own capital because now they're a, a, a separate entity, and, and so they made their own capital in Samaria. The Samaritan people also decided, uh, they, they pretty much disregarded the Old Testament except for the first five books, the Pentateuch, the books Moses wrote. They, they received those five books and didn't learn the rest of the Old Testament because in the rest of the Old Testament, it talked about how Jerusalem was supposed to be the place um, for, for the temple and for the capital and all those things. Well, you don't want to read that all the time if you've already set up your own capital and your own place of worship. And, and so... Uh, what had happened is there's the, the, the northern kingdom, the southern kingdom. Um, the northern kingdom gets attacked. They exile the majority of the people. They leave some of the Jews there. And then all of the pagan, the, uh, pagan communities around that um, are either brought in or come in to that region. And so no longer is it just Israel. There's Jews there, but now all these pagan communities are there also. And they start intermarrying. And so their religion gets really watered down and skewed and kind of off base. Uh, the, the people that are being reproduced in that area are, are being, are, they're, they're half Jewish. And so the Jews look down their noses at them as half breeds. Saw them as unclean, as a, as a mixed grouping uh, um, that, that shouldn't have been. And so uh, they were scoffed at, they were ridiculed, they were hated. In fact, many people especially rabbis, um, would not go through Samaria because they believed the people to be unclean. They didn't want to uh, be around them. Uh, and so they would go the long routes around. So it's interesting here because it says he had to go through Samaria. Most people didn't. But he had to. I think what we'll see here today is that he had to, not because of urgency to get through it, because there was a divine uh, plan and appointment in it. Jesus had to go through Samaria um, so that we would have the beauty of what we look at today and that there would be a redeemed life and, and pretty much that there would be a revival that happens in, in a pagan land. It's awesome. Should probably go at a faster pace than this or we'll be here till Tuesday. So... So he came to a town in Samaria <laughs> called Sikar, which is about 20 miles, they believe, from where he would have started this journey. Um, and it's not a smooth journey. It's more like a hike. Uh, it's, it's a rough journey. And so here we are. It says, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. And Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. 
This is a story that shows us very clearly uh, Jesus is fully God and fully man, the humanity side of Jesus. That after this trip, he's tired. The translation is wearied, which literally means to the point of sweat and exhaustion. It's not like tired, like, oh, I'm just kind of tired. It's, it's wore out. And it's only noon. And so he's there at noon, and, and this is the heat of the day. And he's by the well. He's sitting there exhausted. Um, he's stopped in this, this land here. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, it's pretty normal. It's a normal task. The women went out to get the water. They'd have to collect enough for a full day. They'd come back the next day. Primarily, um, they say historically, that the, the women came either in the morning or in the evening, but not at high noon when it's hot. That they came uh, when the sun was either coming up or going down, and they came in groups. The whole village or town would come out, the women would come out together. It was kind of a social thing where they would get their water, and then they'd go back into town to do their, the rest of their duties for the day or, or to get ready for nighttime for the next day. Um, but this woman comes by herself. We'll see later uh, maybe one reason that that happens. But this is a Samaritan Woman. The Jews would see Samaritans as a half breed, as a lower down that they'd look down on. And a woman in that culture and time, uh, Jewish men did not speak to in public. It was frowned on to even speak to a woman in public, especially a rabbi. And Jesus is known as a teacher, as rabbi. The Samaritan woman came to draw water. Jesus said to her, <laughs> This is awesome. Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. So Jesus is there by himself. He sent off, apparently they need a lot of food. If 12 guys need to go get it. But um, he, he had sent off his disciples to go get food. He stays there alone. And this woman comes alone. Instead of the, the social regular times, uh, instead of being with the people, she comes by herself midday. And now it's just her and Jesus. She comes to the well. Men wouldn't normally talk to her, especially Jews, especially a rabbi. And, and we have Jesus here opened up a conversation with a woman that was looked down on by society. We'll see some of why that is. And asked her for a drink. His disciples are gone, so we can't ask them. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew. It's interesting. It doesn't say why she knew that. But apparently, uh, based on who he was, she could tell that he was Jewish. You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? And John gives us a side note. For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Associate doesn't just mean that they don't uh, interact with. The, the literal word there for uh, not associating is not using utensils and dishes. And so it's much, there's the broad sense, which is true, that they would go around that land, they saw people as unclean, but they definitely wouldn't use the same dishes as you. Because that was definitely, like, that was even another level of unclean. And so uh, very clearly here, we see a deeper level of maybe what our understanding was before. You ask me, why is a Jewish man are you even talking to me? I'm a Samaritan and I'm a woman. You're a Jew and a man. And now you've asked me to get a drink of water for you. We don't even share conversation normally. And, and you people stay all the way away from our dishes and utensils and stuff because you see us as unclean. What are you doing? You were a Jew, I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her. <laughs> if you knew the gift of God, what's the gift of God? Salvation. If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, if you knew the gift of God, if you knew what salvation is all about and you realize that the Savior that brings that salvation is standing in front of you, this conversation will go different. You see me as maybe just a, this Jewish guy that opened up uh, against my tradition to talk to you. Um, it's much more than that going on right here. If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. If you knew that salvation was the issue, that I am the Savior, you would have asked me for much more than a cup of, like I'm asking you. I'm asking you for a cup of like tangible, regular water. Um, if you knew who I am and the plan on why I came, you would have asked me for life and I'd have given it to you. Okay. 
Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with. She doesn't get it yet. And we can't pretend like we would have gotten it. It's easy for us in Scripture because now we have an understanding sometimes to go like, can you believe her? It's so clear. <laughs> He's right there laying it all out. Like We can't pretend that because my guess is that we didn't get it for a long time until we got it. That God was speaking to us and then he revealed it to us. And now the people in your life when that happened, they're like, man, I've been telling you that for years. And you've done that, right? Like you've told somebody something a billion times and they get it and you go like, yeah, you're right. You just got it. It has nothing to do with the fact that I've been sitting here saying it forever. Um, Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. It really is a very deep well, upwards of 100 feet. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself? as did also his sons and his livestock. Short answer, yes. He's greater. He is. Um, there's an interesting thing about those statements there, is it doesn't, it, it doesn't kind of let us know how it was said. Although there's question marks, um, we don't know if those are curious questions or kind of like a mocking statement. We don't know if that's like, oh, are you greater then? Because you've had people ask a question before, and it wasn't really a question. It was like, oh, Really? Um, and so we don't really know that here, but we do know um, is that she's curious, like, what are you talking about? He's now got her engaged in this conversation, uh, wanting to know some more about what's going on. Sir, the woman said, uh, you have nothing to draw with this well is deep. Where can you get this living water? And then goes on to say, are you greater than our ancestors? Yes. Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. Clearly, everybody knows that there. They had to come every day to get new water. It was work. It was a struggle. You had to do something to get the, the sustenance and, and, and strength that you needed. Right? You had to go out there to get the water to, to give you the... You don't need water to live, right? You had to go out there to get that water that was temporary. had you coming back every day for more. Much like how religion does. To try to be good enough. You, every day you got to wake up again. And feel like, oh, I'm still not good enough. Because you're not on your own strength, ever. But he says, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. It's a soul satisfaction. It's a deep level thing and, and, and goes on. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. How awesome is that? Not only will, will you take this in and it'll um, sustain you, but it, it, it's a spring that, that just gives eternal life. That's what happens when we put our faith in Jesus. He says, uh, the, the plan, if you knew the plan, like if, you, if you knew the gift, salvation, and understood that the Savior's in front of you, he'd give you living water. What happens when he reveals himself to us and we get it for the first time, we put our faith in him? The Bible says that his spirit comes to live inside of us, and his spirit inside of us empowers and gives us strength to walk this thing out. And it sanctifies and continues to cleanse, much like a fresh spring. Water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I don't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. Again, it's easy for us to assume she should have understood this. But if you're a woman that potentially because of shame or, or maybe being an outcast doesn't come at the regular times with the other women, comes midday, it's the hottest, it's a struggle, you have to come out here and get this. Even though there's a massive revelation going on and we can see the beauty of what Jesus is saying, you might really be stuck on, could, because I'm sick of coming out here. The practical piece of what you think is being said. Um, and Jesus won't let it just lie there like that. He's really interested in her understanding what he's saying. He told her, go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, You are right when you say that you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sounds pretty harsh. Uh, he takes it to a deeper level. He really grabs her attention. I read a, a statement this week from... Um, 
a pastor, his name is John Piper, in his a, a book called Desiring God, and he was talking about some of these passages, uh, and specifically about this. Uh, he said, you know, it sounds kind of harsh, but there was a broken space there, the, the place that she probably would have felt shame and guilt about uh, culturally and in, in society there, um, and the, the quickest way to the heart is through a wound. And I thought about that, and I thought, like, man, the majority of us, if we're just being honest, came to God because of a place of brokenness. And God worked in that wound to, to grab our hearts and to bring hope and healing and to reveal himself to us because before there was those places we thought we were good. But, but he uses those things uh, to reveal himself to us. And we should praise God for that, that in our brokenness he comes to that, that, that place. Um, and if we're just honest, sometimes God is like maybe not sat at a well and had a conversation quite like this, but he's spoken to you about your brokenness, and you're like, why are you bringing that up? And the reason that he is is because it's time to deal with some things, and he does it in a loving and gracious way like Jesus does here. Uh, he goes to the outcast. He goes to the one pushed far, not only from the Jews, but from their own community, looked down on as a Samaritan woman, and now we see as a promiscuous uh, Samaritan woman that would have been outcast, 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 and the Savior of the world came to, to save the broken and the lost. And, and so he sits down with a woman that society wouldn't want to be around and, and reveals to her who he is. Okay. I have no husband, she replied. You were right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you've had five husbands. The man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Jesus there takes it up a level. I'm not just a Jewish guy. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you're a prophet. Our ancestors worship on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. She doesn't want to talk about the husband issue. So she, she moves on to some doctrine. Um, and, and, and what we talked about earlier, they had, they, they had different places for their, their, their places of worship and a different capital for each one of them. And so in a real literal sense, she's saying, like, this is where we gather and worship. We're part of a different kingdom with a different capital, a different place of worship. Um, and so uh, we worship here. You Jews say that's not right, that worship is supposed to happen in Jerusalem. What's the deal? Woman, Jesus replied, believe me. A time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. Uh. I told you before, their, their religion uh, was very limited. It was partial in understanding based on their, their only wanting to, to take the scriptures that they felt good about. Okay. partial in their understanding of the revelation that was the Old Testament at that time. They only used what they wanted and the places they wanted that confirmed the ways that they wanted to worship. They also had been influenced massively by the pagan societies around them. So Jesus says, like, you, you think you're worshiping God. You're worshiping, you don't even know. Like, you don't even know who and, and what you're worshiping here. You, you Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know. For salvation is from the Jews. Jesus comes through that. It's from them, not just for them. But through that line and from them, we have Jesus, our Messiah, that is all of our saviors. If he's not, he can be before you leave today. Yet a time is coming and has now come when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers our Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. That's an all-inclusive type of statement. That's an all-in kind of worship. And that worship isn't just when we make a script for what we do during service on Sunday, a few songs at the beginning and a song at the end. Although that's part of how we worship, it is a part of how we worship. That worship is a, is a life thing. It's not a categorized to a, a type thing. It's not, well, oh, I couldn't really feel worship today because I'm not really down for that kind of music. Worship is a heart issue. It's a spirit and truth thing. It's not a style thing. 
Worship is wholehearted, all in, everything I have. That's why it says spirit and truth. That's talking about uh, you understand the truth of what you're doing, and it's a deep down spirit level worship. And it's not, he says it's not about a, a, a location, it's about, well, prostration, which means a laying down of self. The word worship in scripture oftentimes literally translated is to lay down on your face. It's saying you are awesome, you are God. Now, when we sing his praises, that's definitely worship. Do that with everything, spirit and truth, but don't limit it to that. It's, it's a fully complete all in, everything I have is, is, is submitted to you as Lord. Jesus is Lord. We've made the statement, but we make it with our lives when we worship with everything. Hmm. Sorry, today's not about worship, but I had to, uh, it says it here, so we had to talk about it for a second. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. It's expressing our love and our gratitude and our thanks and our faith and our adoration. The woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. So, <laughs> we have this scene laid out pretty well. Jesus is at the well, tired, exhausted, to the point of sweat and exhaustion, thirsty, he's asking for a drink, hungry, he sent his disciples there. It's midday, it's hot. He's by himself. This woman comes out, this woman that's, that's in a, a broken stage of life, um, uh, seems to be outcast from her own social group that would normally come during the morning or the evening. She's a Samaritan, so Jews would have pushed her to the side. She's a woman, so she's not supposed to be spoken to in public. Isn't that just like Jesus? Jesus is like, oh man, keep adding the reasons why I shouldn't come reveal myself to you, because I just love doing this. And that's our life, right? Like we could come up with all kinds of reasons and, and ways that, that, that we, we don't deserve to be saved. But God is so good. Out of his love, he shows up in our brokenness, in our broken state, in our broken place, uh, and reveals himself to us. So she says, great. First I saw that you were a Jew and a male. Now, then I saw that you were a prophet. Um, now you just taught well. I could probably assume you're a rabbi, but all of this will make much more sense when the Messiah comes because he's coming. She had a grasp of that. I don't know how it was taught to her um, based on her culture there, but she had a grasp of that. She says, when the Messiah comes, it'll all make sense. And here it comes. <laughs> and Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. That's an I am statement. God's so awesome. This is one of the clearest places Jesus says who he is. One of the like, most clear, just there it is. When the Messiah comes, that's me. Couldn't be more clear, could it? And instead of doing it in the temple to the high priest at the time, He's meeting with, with someone that the society would look down on him for even being around. And he declares, he reveals, he opens her eyes to see and her ears to hear and, and declares to her, I'm the Messiah. It's revealed to her on a, on a revelation level, on an accepting by faith type of level. Um, I'll show you how that looks in a minute. But Jesus reveals himself to a promiscuous Samaritan woman, not the high priest man in the temple. If you're taking notes right, impacted lives impact lives. Impacted lives impact lives. Do you ever notice that oftentimes the most on fire uh, declarer of the gospel is the newly saved? It's because they just came in contact with Jesus. They didn't know him. It didn't make sense to them. And then all of a sudden one day they went out to the well and there he was. And maybe they didn't even understand it at first. And then we were there at some point. And unfortunately sometimes the old crusty dusty Christians that we can be tell them like slow down, you'll understand. Eventually you'll realize 
that, it, that, that it's, it's not all the hype that you feel or whatever, right? Like I've seen young, and I don't mean young by age, I mean in faith, um, excited believers that have been like just quenched because we're so like, I don't know what it is, stupid? <laughs> Impacted lives impact lives. We're so afraid that they might go say something wrong. Like, oh, don't go tell anybody anything until you sit down for the next five years and I teach you doctrine from uh, systematic theology. <laughs> Let's read this book together. There is a place, and we should long to and do well at discipling new believers. It should inspire and encourage the changed lives that change lives, not dampen and, and destruct. Just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked, what do you want or why are you talking with her? Interesting, right? Kind of make a judgment about what's going on here. This is not normal or supposed to happen. But none of them say anything. One is out of respect, I'm sure, because he's the rabbi, they're the students. He's the teacher, they're the students. And um, so they, they come back, they see this going on, they don't say anything. Now look at this. Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, I'm going to stop there just for a second. Leaving the water jar? She came out there with one purpose, one job, one plan. Hey, at noon today when nobody's there, I'm going to go there by myself as an outcast and get the water that is necessary for the next day. So I have one purpose. You have one purpose. Go there and get water. So she brings the water uh, jugs and she, she shows up and comes in contact with Jesus. And instantly that day, because of a revelation of who Jesus is, as Jesus reveals himself to her, everything changes right now. My plans, my purposes are superseded and, and, and there's a priority now. Uh, I just came in contact with, with the Son of God, the God-man Jesus Christ. <laughs> And it changes everything that she leaves that there and goes back to town without what she planned on that day. Leaving her water jar, the woman went back to town and said to the people, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. <laughs> That's interesting. Everything I ever did. I wonder if this conversation was longer than what we get a picture of right here. Right there, it just spoke about husbands. She says, I, he read the news. Like he read me and just told me about it. Come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Now listen, could this be the Messiah? Um, there's an interesting thing we need to realize here. Is that most scholars, as I read and, and kind of worked through the scriptures this week, um, they believe that that's not a question of her wondering. It's more of a question to draw them in. I just met Jesus. You should come see if he's the Messiah. And that because of her status in the community, she couldn't come back and just direct people to come. But if she came and said, this guy told me everything about me and you know me, could he be the Messiah? That people would go like, we better go check. Let's go see if that's really him. Um, this is awesome. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. Listen to how simple that part of her story is. She went from the broken state of being looked down on by everyone um, to now, because of coming in contact with Jesus, it was his plan. He came into that city to meet her. He kept just revealing who he is and his plan until she got it and he just had to lay it out there and she understood it and she went back and the message was you should come see Jesus. Her, her, her story was I ran into Jesus. You should see, c come see, come meet him. We would do well at making our testimony something like that. Man, I was, I was far from, I was way off and then one day Jesus showed up on the scene. Listen, 
came out of the town and made their way toward him. Meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. We told you he was hungry, he's thirsty, he's tired, he's sitting there. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Then his disciples said to each other, could someone have brought him food? Like I said, let's not pretend like we would have understood these things. The disciples walked with him. He says these statements that you just kind of go like, I feel like every time you just be like, Jesus, are we talking about the real thing right now or are we talking about something different? Is this a, is this a deeper message? <laughs> like when you say you're hungry, should we just stop and be like, tell us more? Like, or should we get you some food? Because I'm really confused. <laughs> Could someone have brought him food? Listen, my food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Jesus came to seek and save the lost. Jesus right now is doing what he came to do. He came to the, the broken and the lost space and has, has done a work. He, he's like, the, the, you guys are going to meet her in a minute. She'll be right back. Actually, they just saw her run off and leave her water jar. They saw her there. Um, and, and, and he says, like, I just ate. I just did what I was sent here for. I feel nourished and, and restored and, and, and good right now. I feel strengthened because I'm doing what I'm built for, what I'm here for, and that's why we believe that she was saved. It's a saving faith, not a, could this be the Messiah? But a, I just ran into Jesus. You should go see that he's the Messiah. Because Jesus was just, ate food, and it wasn't real food. It was to do the will of the one who sent him, that he was sent by the Father to save people. And that's what just happened. My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Don't you have a saying? It's still four months until harvest. I tell you, open up your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for the harvest. Even now, the one who reaps draws a wage and harvests a crop for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper will be glad together. Okay, it sounds almost like he just went to just talking about all of a sudden uh, agriculture a little bit, and then he mixed in some of the eternal life thing. Like, okay, what are you talking about, Jesus? Remember something. The people are on their way out there. The people are already on their way out there. So when he says, lift up your eyes and see, he's not saying like, hey, look out there at, at the trees and the, the wheat or whatever it is coming up, right? He, he literally is saying like, look, here it comes. The harvest is on the way. You say, you know, it's this long until harvest is ready. I'm telling you, it's time to harvest, boys. Here they come. Thus the saying, one sows, another reaps, is true. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work, and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. Listen. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. I understand that maybe there's places in your life that God's still doing a work and you're not ready to, to share um, maybe openly on a, on a whatever scale that might be. Um, I pray that you would pray to God about, God, how do I tell part of my story to get you glory? Maybe you're in the middle of some of that right now. Maybe you're in the middle of that brokenness and the middle of that pain and that struggle and that hurt. And in it, you don't even see how he plans to get glory. You just realize somehow this happened to be a part of my story that I'm in, and I don't even like my story. Like, what's going on? Oftentimes, uh, those are the times we have to go back and remember that he works all things to the good of those who love him. That are called according to his purposes. Well, if you love him, you can't love him without being called according to his purposes already. So it, it, when you love God, that he works all things out for the good of those who love him. So that, okay, God, you have a plan to work this out for my good. Not necessarily how I describe it, but it is for my good and it's for your glory. God is interested in his glory and interested in your good. And they're in the same thing. That is, you strive to give him glory. It's good for you. And it doesn't mean it always works out exactly how you want it to. In fact, in the middle of it, it's really, really hard sometimes to say like, okay, God, I don't understand how this is going to be used for good. All this feels like is pain and destruction, and all I'm having, a, I'm having a hard time not just seeing this end badly. You have to go back to the promises of God. You have to put your trust in Him as a God that loves you more than you can even comprehend. 
and that it doesn't mean that the broken, flawed world around you or the broken and flawed people around you uh, won't do things that you can't control, but he's in control and he will use it for good. Persevere, stick with him, cling to him. And when you can't in your own strength cling to him anymore, remember that you are in his hands and he's stronger than anything that can come against him. you're in the middle of your story right now, a story of brokenness, keep moving through it because he plans to use that story for his glory. That you would praise him for being with you and and getting you through this. I understand if you're not ready to share some of those parts of your story because it's so fresh or or new, or maybe it's been a little while, but it's still something you're working through. Um, I'm not trying to, to force anybody to do that. What I would say is pray to God. Pray to God and ask him, God, where could, where could I use parts of my story? What parts of my story would, would be something that I could share that wouldn't be about me boasting and what I've done, but that would point to the fact that you're the, you're the reason. You're the one. You're the way. You showed up in this space. I was broken because of mankind and humanity and the things around me, but you were there, and I made it through because of you. And, and when we point people or talk to people about our story, that it points to Jesus and his goodness and his love. Many of the Samaritans from the town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did, she said. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. This is pretty spectacular. A lot of other places in Scripture where Jesus is like healing and doing all these things, um, people would want him to stay, and he'd be like, I can't. I have other things I need to go do. I, I, I need to go preach other places. I need to go. And so he's, he's, he's moving, and he's moving. And there, there's places where they tried to say, like, Jesus, you need to stay here with us, where he would keep moving. This is the, the only place, really, where you see where he expresses who he is, and then they ask him to stay, and he does. In Samaria, with the, what, what was viewed down as from his people, the, the Jews look down on these people, and that's where he stays. Like he reveals himself to the promiscuous Samaritan woman and then goes and just stays in Samaria so that he can teach them because they're, you, you worship what you do not know. So for two days, Jesus says, I'm Jesus, and here's what that means. And he delivers the gospel to a community and and one got saved and then others started to believe because of her testimony and then Jesus just camps out there for a couple days and and continues to deliver the good news about who he is and what that means that we can be right with God, the Father, the creator of the world. We can have a thriving, awesome relationship with him daily because of what Jesus does and has done. He stayed for two days and because of his words, many more became believers. There's a revival that kicks off. The place that the Jews wouldn't go to, Jesus goes through, and a revival kicks off. People just keep getting saved. He said to the woman, or they said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves and we know that this man really is the savior of the world. That's the hope. Your story, his glory. The hope is, you know what? I'm going to tell you about the guy. I'm not perfect, but guess what? I ran into the perfect one. It just so happened I was, I, I didn't realize that the, or understand fully what that meant at first, and then he just showed up on the scene. He revealed himself to me. I can't boast on anything. I didn't do any works to make it happen. I, I was about my regular business, and Jesus showed up. And, and could this be the Messiah? Could this be what you've been looking for? Why don't you come check it out? In fact, don't just believe it because of my belief now. Why don't you come listen to him? Why don't you ask God if this is the Messiah or not? Why don't you go have a a conversation and see if Jesus will reveal himself to you? It's a transfer that has to happen. You're not saved through somebody else's faith. You're you're not saved through somebody else's relationship. You're saved by by the work of Jesus and you put in your faith in God through Christ that you stand confident walking into his presence. Your story, you have a story. Your story matters. 
And it's for his glory. He's the main character. He's the one that came in. He's the, he's the, the superhero. He's the game changer. And I want us to, to just realize that today. As we, as we read through this and see stories, realize you have one and don't compare it to what you find in this book. Your story is amazing. You were dead in your transgressions. The Bible says you were the enemy of God. And your story has to do with the fact that God wasn't uh, okay with that. And so he came, he did the work to take you from enemies to sons and daughters, to far from, to, to, to close to and reconciled in relationship with story has the ability to spark curiosity in someone to come check out the one who changed your story. And God has a plan to get glory through your story. I want to pray for us here in just a moment. Make sure every family grab one of these on your, your way out today. There'll be people making sure that that happens. Two things you got on the way in I want to talk to you about for a moment. Um, one, it's the ties and offering envelope. This is how we give financially here at the church. Uh, also, you can give online if um, you're so compelled. Uh, if you came ready to give today, do it. Awesome. If you didn't, don't feel like I'm trying to get you to. Okay, that was easy. Um, the connect card. The front is for information because we want to get to know you, but the back I want you to check out for just a moment and then we'll close up service. This is a time in service that's a response time that we've worshiped, sat under the word, and hopefully the Holy Spirit has been doing a work inside of our hearts. And it's time for us to have a faith response that we've never arrived. We always have another step of walking this journey out with God. It's a beautiful thing. This is a response time. So on here are some places that you may be ready to respond today. The first one is I'm, I'm making a first-time decision to give my life to Jesus. Praise God, the only way to have a relationship, to be uh, forgiven of our sins, to be made righteous, and, and to have a relationship with God is through the works of Jesus Christ. It is a, a free gift given that we would respond by faith, put our trust, our hope in Jesus Christ and the work he has done and give our life to him. Declare Jesus is Lord. So if you're ready to do that today, um, praise God. And I don't mean just praise God as the statement we say, as like praise God, but I mean like literally we should praise God Be because he drew you to himself. Y y you're the woman at the well where Jesus just shows up and so am I and so is everybody else. So don't feel bad that I just called you a promiscuous Samaritan woman. It wasn't in her own strength that it was revealed that day. It's Jesus, so praise God that he's drawing you to himself because he loves you so much and isn't okay with you being distant. I'm recommitting my life to Jesus. Maybe somewhere along the line you said a prayer to start a relationship or maybe somewhere you walked with God for a while and, 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 and then were either distracted or rebellious or, or whatever it was and, and have gone far from God or you feel far from God. Praise God that today he's put it on your heart um, to come back in a relationship and walk with him regularly. Again, that's awesome. I'm ready to be baptized. Do you know in a few minutes we're going to baptize? Uh, like one o'clock today, we're baptizing. There's a ha yeah, that's exciting. There's a handful of people. There's a handful of people that are ready today um, to outwardly show, I've given my life to Jesus. The old me is dead and gone. The new me is here in Christ. And I'm part of the family of believers. And so um, if you can stick around for a few minutes, um, that would be amazing because we love to have the area around the pool just filled with brothers and sisters in Christ that will cheer for them. Um, and if you came today and you want to be baptized and you didn't bring the stuff, um, we'll baptize you anyway in the stuff you're in. You'll just go home wet. Sorry. Um, I'm interested in becoming a member of The Roots. We have a membership class today at two. Uh, I do believe that the Bible is clear that you're, to be, you're called to be a participating member of a local body. Um, and so if it is this one, Praise God, that's awesome. We would love to have you be a part of the body. If it isn't this one, um, 
You know, it's more important to us that you find a church that preaches Jesus, loves Jesus, and loves you, and that you feel like is the right space for you than it is for us to try to, like, make you be a member here. Um, so just do it somewhere. Now, if it's here, awesome. Am I a little biased? Of course, I want you to be here. But I'd rather have you participate somewhere than nowhere. I would like to join a community group. We need authentic relationships that we can have dialogues with and walk this thing out with. I'm interested in serving at the roots. Um, you have gifts and abilities that God's uh, given you to edify his body of believers, which means strengthen, encourage, um, build up. And so uh, if you're not ready to start doing that, we'll get you there. Um, if you are, let's do it. And then look at this. It says, I will, and there's a blank. I do not want to pretend like all of the options on what the Holy Spirit might be doing in your heart today are on this card. You know what? It might be something about today. It, it might be. It might be, you know what, God? Uh, I'm going to share the story that you've given me that I, that I have a hard time sharing. I'm going to do that. It might be com completely different. God's so awesome. We might be talking about this and the Holy Spirit speaking to you about something else that, 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 that requires a faith step. And I pray that you would move in that way. And then the bottom is prayer requests and praise reports. We're going to have prayer partners in just a moment as we worship on the sides. You need prayer for anything they'd love to pray with you. When you write it here, it helps us to be able to pray during the week about it. Uh, and then praise reports there. We also like to celebrate things that God's doing in people's lives. And so, like I said, this is a time for response that we're about to go into. So I'm going to pray. And then um, our, our response is we're going to worship. We're going to have prayer partners. Um, these are ways to respond with the next step today, with honoring God financially. Um, and so after we worship and pray, uh, on our way out, there's going to be an usher at each door that has a blue bucket. If you would just drop those things in there, um, that would be awesome. And then grab uh, your copy of, of the book today. It's free. Just grab it on the way out and read it. Um, that would be awesome. God, we thank you for the opportunity to be here. God, you are so amazing. God, I thank you that you go to places that, that expose our brokenness or are in our place of brokenness to find us where we were at, Lord God. God, you are so good. God, help us to boast in you. God, for, for maybe some of us today that, that don't feel uh, the strength or, or maybe um, we're not through the space in our story to be able to share it in a way um, that points to you confidently, Lord God. I pray for strength. I pray for courage. I, I pray that you would continue to do the redeeming work that you're doing. God, I, I pray for hope in dark spaces. I pray for godly friends and insight. I pray for wisdom that surpasses our own. I pray for comfort that comes because of your presence. God, I, I, for relationships that are broken, I pray reconciliation. God, that first and foremost, bo mo both people's hearts would be drawn towards you. And that in that, you would reconcile them together. God, places of lack of provision, that we would put our faith and our trust in you. Knowing that you are a provider. God, places where people's bodies are broken. In our church today, I know that we have from young to old that are believing for healing. God, I ask for that in a way that only you would get glory for. God, I know there's other things that I haven't mentioned, but God, you know, you know every single person in this room. You love every person in this room. You know our hearts, you know our dealings, you know our struggles, you know our strengths, and you love us. God, I pray that you would continue to reveal yourself to us. And I pray that our changed lives would inspire changed lives. God, help us to point with our story to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand. Let's worship together.